Here tonight, we'd like to share our school improvement plan for the 12 13 school year for Shoreview Elementary. We have broken our program into three sections climate, math, and reading. And so, I will begin with our climate. And um, as you know, we are a brand new elementary school, so we have chosen to this year begin collecting our baseline data. We have not set um, goals with numbers for our climate in terms of reducing suspension or, or anything of that nature because what we want to do is collect the data. We did not want to use data from uh, previous elementary schools. So we are going to begin with our Shoreview Pledge. These are some of our fifth grade students. Shoreview Elementary has been developed through um, input from our teachers. We began at our first staff meeting back in August. We developed our mission and our vision statement and we worked throughout the next um, several weeks uh, within staff meetings and with um, time with the teachers to really develop a mission and a vision statement that ties in nicely with the district vision and mission statement. And basically what came out of everyone's comments was that we want to teach our children to think, 
Those critical thinking skills are so incredibly important, and we want them to become productive members of society. We know that we owe a great deal to the community for these beautiful new schools that we have, and we want our students to be able to give back to the community. We know that our 21st century skills are going to be extremely important for our students, so we want to make sure that we tie that in with our vision statement. As I mentioned with the climate, we did not want to use Upson or Memorial data where most of our students came from because we want to develop our own climate, we want to develop our own baseline data as the year goes on. But what we knew we needed to do was to develop a building climate committee to make sure that we had a voice for our staff, that we had a voice for some of the concerns that were not only coming from um, the, the students, but also possibly from parents and from, and from our staff members. So the purpose of our building climate committee is to discuss building concerns while looking at building data. We brainstorm solutions and then report out at staff meetings on what we plan to do. We have had the um, opportunity to meet a couple of times this year, and the idea is to meet periodically and to kind of take out small chunks and, and move from there. As far as our positive behavior supports, we, um, we have responsive classroom where we have our, um, we have nearly 75% of our classroom teachers trained in responsive classroom. We pass out golden tickets to the students and these are tickets that they earn in common areas and it may be their teacher that gives them to them but primarily it's, it's teachers from other, um, from other parts of the, um, building or, or other staff members that, you know, hand the tickets to the children for doing what, what is expected of them. We have weekly prize drawings where the students' names are called on Friday afternoon and they earn little trinkets just to recognize their, their uh, positive choices. And we have monthly principals' luncheons that we have um, nine students K through two and nine students K th or three through five who um, have a lunch with the principal uh, on the first Friday of every month. At the end of the year, we will also have our yearly drawing where there's larger prizes and the students kind of choose if they want to participate in weekly, monthly, or a yearly drawing. Our building-wide expectations, we have posters throughout the building. The children are constantly reminded of what's expected in their behavior, not only through modeling of the teacher, but also the posters that they see throughout the building. Expectations assemblies are done. Uh, we had one at the beginning of the year. There will be one after the winter break and then another one in the spring. And again, like I said, the posters that they see throughout the building. We also have a monthly lunch staff meeting that either myself or Mrs. Boca are present at. And we feel that it's so important to include our lunch staff. They spend an hour a day with our children. So we want to make sure that the, the language that we're using um, in the classroom and throughout the building is being reiterated also during the lunch time. As we look towards the future, we have begun the process of a check-in, check-out system where we have identified staff members who are available, uh, have a little more flexible schedule than say a general ed classroom teacher to work with those students who may have trouble, um, maybe you know, kind of on the edge of suspensions or multiple suspensions, and we want to make sure that those students have a trusted adult that they can check in and check out with throughout the day, whether it's once, twice, or maybe even three times a day. We are expanding our on-site counseling. We have been using Nancy Lowry and Associates as they come into our building, and they uh, provide counseling for our students. It is an outside agency, but they use our, um, our building. And I am meeting with Nancy Lowry this week to expand on that because we see that the number of students that want to participate is growing. Our Shoreview Pledge is important to us. Our goal is for all of our children by the end of the year to be able to recite that. What, what do we expect from you at Shoreview and be able to recite the short pledge that you heard at the beginning of the uh, presentation. Our bullying assemblies are important. We've been fortunate enough to, to have one already this year and we hope to have another one um, in the uh, late winter, early spring to remind our students um, about the behaviors that we expect, but if they feel like they are being bullied, what they can do about it and how they can go about solving, helping to solve the problem. And I mentioned that um, so many of our classroom teachers are trained in responsive classroom, but all of our classroom teachers, trained or not, have, are using some form of morning meeting. And the expectation is to use that morning meeting to reflect on the classroom 
climate? What can we do as a classroom to develop a, a stronger community? And so we are working to um, make sure that that, is, if that continues to happen and that, that those problems are um, addressed and that the, the classroom teacher has some input on that. So I am going to turn it over to Erin Norton, our math coach. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when students enter our schools in kindergarten, they often come to us with deficiencies in number sense, including basic skills such as counting and number recognition. Furthermore, they really struggle with their basic fact knowledge, and without that basic fact um, fluency, a foundation in that, they're going to struggle throughout mathematics in school. And that leads us to our goal for Shoreview. By January 2013, we will reduce the number of students in the red from the fall Ames Love benchmark by 20% as measured by the winter Ames Love math computation. So they all took um, a math computation assessment in the fall, and this is an example of one of the pyramids generated for one grade level, but it happens to be very representative of actually most of the grade levels. So the red shows the students that are below target, the yellow near target, and the green at target. So um, we chose 20%. We didn't choose 10% because we thought that wouldn't make a big enough impact. And we chose, we wouldn't choose 30% because we have to keep in mind that not only are we trying to raise students out of the red into at least the yellow, we need to keep kids that may be in the yellow from slipping back into the red. To achieve this goal, um, one of the things we plan or that we are doing is are incorporating number talks at least three times per week in our K through five classrooms. Number talks are an excellent way to help develop number sense and address some weaknesses that the students might have. Um, log every student in grades one through five on First in Math. If you're not familiar with First in Math, it's an online math resource that um, it's very offers very comprehensive content from simple addition all the way up to complex algebra. Our students use it mainly for math fact practice. It's very engaging, it gives immediate feedback, and so it's an excellent resource. Um, using intervention enrichment time to differentiate instruction. This is uh, intervention enrichment time. There's 45 minutes every day of the week put into the schedule of all K through five teachers this year. And it's designed for them to use, um, it's designed so that they have time to address things outside of their math and reading class time, um, and it's to intervene or enrich, depending on the needs of their students. And we at Shoreview, all the grade levels are using at least some of those days to address math. And um, they will either address weaknesses that they have on certain skills or to maybe address a lack of prerequisite skills that they need in order to succeed at the grade level they're at. We also have some grade levels who have mixed groups during that time. What I mean by that, um, they will get together as a team, grade level team, and take the kids and divide them based on the need they have. Maybe each teacher would take a different concept based on an assessment that um, students had taken. And then they would, um, it didn't matter if they were your student or not, if they were a fifth grade student during that time. So that's a, um, we found that's a great way to differentiate instruction and meet the kids' needs. Monitoring individual student growth with basic fact knowledge. As I said, basic fact um, knowledge is really critical in order to be successful in mathematics moving forward. Um, so every grade level has some way of addressing the needs of the basic facts and monitoring their students' growth of their basic facts. And I'm going to, um, we'll take a look at a couple examples of how they're monitoring that in a minute or two. Um, ongoing professional development in math um, for content knowledge for the teachers, actually. And that's offered during the professional development days district-wide, as well as during our um, weekly collaboration meetings. There's often times where I'm able, to, as the math coach, to offer some professional development. And Do the Math Intervention, Do the Math is an excellent intervention program that we have purchased this year that um, is designed to address your biggest strugglers. I'm seeing a group of third, fourth, and fifth grade students, which would be the lowest achieving in the, um, the lowest achieving on grade level as determined by that Ames Web Math Computation. And 
And um, on this next slide, you can see this is the results as of last Tuesday with the progress monitoring with those students that I see that right now about 67% of them are either near or above their um, targeted goal. Here are, um, this is an example of one of our grade levels monitoring system for their facts. Um, this is our fourth grade actually, some of our fourth grade teachers, and they give them a fact test on addition and they look at the student's results and determine what areas they might need. For example, they might see, oh, they can't seem to add their sevens and their eights. They'll work on strategies with the students on that, and then they give them another assessment to see if they've improved. If they become a master, they get their name up there and the date that they mastered it, and they move on to subtraction and so forth, then to multiplication, then division, then a mixed practice. That's one example, one of our grade levels. Um, second grade at my building, they all gave, uh, they decided to strategically monitor their students' progress for facts um, using AIMSWeb. And um, this way they would know where their students are at prior to the winter benchmark. Um, this is an example of a graph for one of the second grade classrooms. The yellow um, over there on the right shows you how per group, this teacher's group has moved from the yellow on the left, and the blue dot shows this a specific student's progress from where they were, were where they were in September to where they are now. Um, so this shows at a quick glance how her class has moved and they've moved up. And um, it also gives some information um, when they use this strategic monitoring to show um, how far away students are from the goal that's in January prior to it being too late because you're already there. So it gives them an opportunity to look at a student that hasn't made any progress in September, even if they're a higher achieving student, or the student that hasn't made any progress and they're a lower achieving student, just who needs a little more intensive work um, and helps them keep track of that on the way. In the future, we're, having, we're going to have after school tutoring of targeted students using Do The Math. So we've already chosen some students um, that we are going to send letters out to offer that to. And also, I'll be sharing the advantage of this game club strategic monitoring that the second grade teachers used with some other grade levels, and hopefully they'll choose to use that as well. Um, a lending library of math resources. We have uh, a lot of valuable math manipulatives and resources in Shoreview, and um, the goal is to have them used in the classroom so that the students can benefit from them. And so we plan to have a math, an inventory list and checkout system so that the teachers can use those. And then classroom support from myself as the coach. I'm going to pass on now to Amy Rosenbaum, our literacy coach. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Like math, we um, also, in reading, our goal is to reduce the number of students in the red by 20%. This will be um, determined at the um, benchmarking that we'll do in January with Ames Web, and we will see how we progress to that goal. Um, when benchmarking, we are looking at early literacy um, measures for kindergarten and first grade, and that entails the um, phonemic segmentation, the um, letter sound, letter name, and um, nonsense words. And for the um, rest, the other grade level, second through fifth, it, they're using the oral reading fluency. Um, after benchmarking, to achieve our goal, we have um, identified the students that have fallen below the 25th percentile. And based on the need, those students will be receiving either intervention service outside the classroom and or inside the classroom. We refer to these groups often as Tier 2 and Tier 1 strugglers. And tier 2 strugglers are those that will receive services outside the classroom in an intervention group. The students are monitored weekly to assess progress through the AIMSWEB. Um,
monitoring students include the progress monitoring that's done weekly, um, weekly fresh reads and or running re records, weekly tests, and um, developmental reading assessments, the DRAs, which are given every three weeks during what we call a customized week. We have a slide of a young man, Isaac Carter, who is, um, Isaac is a fourth grader at Shoreview, and he is going to explain and show you um, what fluency means to him and um, how fluency is being monitored in his classroom.
at least three times. Could you just provide number talk star, maybe give an example? Okay, a number talk is uh, just a very quick five to five to ten minute way to start off a math class, um, or it can be done any time that you find the time to put it in. But where you can give them, um, for example, say you're going to give three plus six plus seven plus four, and it's written horizontally, and the students it's meant done mentally. The students think of the answer, and then have to share strategies for how to get it. So basically. Um, by having it mental math and having shared strategies, there's so many benefits from that. Does that help? No, excellent. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam President. Um, the, uh, and I'm not sure if this is directed necessarily at the Shoreview staff, because maybe it is our district leadership team. The intervention and enrichment periods, is that going on at, I, I thought that was primarily a secondary Strategy is that going on in all of the elementary school buildings? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. And could you provide a bit of an explanation? I'm on page six or hand out. I'm not sure what slide that might be. But what a tier student is, which was in the it was after the it was in the reading section. Okay. You're talking about tier, yeah, you're talking two. About tier one and tier two, and just kind of a, an explanation, clarity on the difference between two and what that what a tier one struggling student looks like and the difference between a tier one struggling student and a tier two struggling student. The tier two struggling student would fall in the lower 25th percentile. And we go as high as we can to meet the needs by the number of tutors that we have available, which this year we have very many. However, once we reach the number of pockets that can be filled, then the tier one strugglers are students that are in the classroom that may not be receiving services at this time, but the teacher has a very strong eye on those particular children working closely with them in the classroom. What are the characteristics of the tier one and tier two students? In other words, we get the 25th percentile. So just what are some of the characteristics? What does that student look like? What Reading look like? below grade level by possibly what could be two to three years below grade level. Um, in this um, essence of, of a kindergarten or first year and those early literacy measures coming in without any letter ID, letter sound correspondence. Um, and then when you're looking at the oral fluency, you're looking at a child that is definitely very, very below grade level. Many um, years, could be anywhere from two to four years below grade level. And that's tier two. Tier two. Now tier one strugglers, May definitely they're definitely performing below grade level, but not that big of a deal. What about the tier three students? The tier three students are ident are special ed identified students, and that tier. Some of them are special ed that are in the red. No, no. Oh, okay. In, in a tier three is different than you know the pyramid that you saw with our red. Um, and so the, just so the board and the public understand, tier three students' services would be different in the fact that they may have some special needs and they may have some restrictions based off of the IEP and based off of what needs to occur at that point would be different than a traditional student that would uh, not fall in that realm. Correct. All right, so to ask some further clarification, so I, I think if I remember the slide, the short view slide, it was 107 tier students? Tier two students that are being serviced outside the classroom in okay. the intervention group. Working with the tutor and or I also have students with in my, um, I have tier two strugglers as well, but um, so they're working in three to four students per one adult. So they're small group instruction, not one on one. Your building climate committee, who participates in it? Our building climate committee was voluntary. We asked teachers to sign up. What we were looking for was one teacher from each grade level and then one from each specialist area. And um, we did have people fill in all those positions. We have yet to have everyone at the table for a meeting just because of scheduling conflicts. But we do have representation from each grade level and then the specialist areas. Have you considered adding in? 
Yes, the problem that we have, our meetings are, are held after school, and so, so they're, they're gone at that time. But like Mrs. Boca and I have both attended, we, we've kind of been trading off with their monthly um, lunch staff meetings, and we bring their concerns so that they do have a voice at the table, even though no one might be present at, at the meeting. Um, when you talk about 75% of your teachers are trained in responsive classroom, um, what are the plans to get the other 25% trained? Well, the idea, we still, as a district, we've still committed to responsive classroom. Um, and those are, um, is, up until now, there's still the summer training. Um, there has been talk, I don't know where we are in terms of having things done throughout the school year, but the idea is to, you know, continue to, to push it, and, and the, the expectation is that, is that teachers use the techniques of responsive classroom, so the training will only help them. Unfortunately, we can't force anyone to take the training, but we do continue to encourage people to, to attend the training and to be a part of some refreshers. We often do them. Um, you know, throughout the year, we, we bring in some techniques at staff meetings and things like that, so that people are definitely aware of them. Can I just add something, Madam Chair, to that? Because I think uh, Mary did a great job in responding to the question. The other part of that, in that equation, when it's not mandatory, what happens is that when we know it's effective, it makes it very difficult for people in the building to not want to do that because they know that it's something that will, that will help students to be successful. So, when, as, as Mrs. Thomas stated, we're encouraging uh, staff members to be a part of that. I think that. Um, based off of the uh, success that they're, that they're having, uh, it encourages the rest of them to want to be involved. So we look forward to just about the entire staff being a part of it. There are some conflicts we have to work through, but the idea is to have everybody be a part of that so we can help that to, to help uh, change our behavior and move things in a positive direction. Okay, um, Mr. Thomas, you mentioned that you have your, you decided to go with your own baseline. And as, as far as building climate goes, what, what I have experienced is that people telling me what a difference it is. And at this point, when we've looked kind of um, quickly, I should say, at the, at the old ups and data, we have exceeded any expectations that we would put. But it's a totally different staff. It's so... so um, we, in, in terms of, of setting that, those goals, we have exceeded in, in terms of, you know, reduction at this point in the school year. So we want to, you know, obviously maintain that, but we want to start a fresh baseline for building goals for the current staff that we have. I understand. I just know that the comparison is going to be okay. made. Um, who gets the counseling that you talked about and how are they chosen? This is a letter that's sent out to every student at the beginning of the year, and it is um, the parents sign up for it, and they you know they take insurance, they um, they take uh, Medicaid, and they take um, private pay. So the parents have to arrange a meeting prior to a counseling session with the counselor and make all of those arrangements. We just literally just provide the space for them to use. I think that's a great way to get some counseling because you know that you know it's going to happen. Um, you kind of answered this on the math poll, because my thing was whether 20% was reasonable. And, you know, I know we have to push, so, you know, I'm kind of glad to see that you're stretching a little bit. Right now. Um, how, what are you using for the differentiated instruction in math? Um, uh, what are different teachers using? Or? Well, I mean, what kinds of, when, you, when you're going to do the intervention, well, one of the ways is how they have taken an assessment, and um, if they were in one teacher's classroom and they uh, looked at their results during collaboration and decided these are the students that didn't do so great on, say, word problems, and then another teacher might be the one then teaching them something, and we talk about different strategies and different ideas of what they could use to approach word problems, or the kids that are still struggling with subtraction, we talk about ideas and specific ways we could teach it differently. Because obviously we understand. If you already taught it, they and they didn't do well teaching them the exact same way again. It would be very surprising. But it's always a discussion. Um, sometimes I give them ideas and resources.
resources, and sometimes they have great ideas themselves that they share, something that another teacher might have used where this one classroom might have done really well on subtraction, so they'll share what they did, um, and then the teachers might use that with their students. Good collaboration. Um, when you're Oh, the slide that showed the math masters, and you said that was fourth grade. Um, how long ago were those slides taken? Um, it was a couple weeks ago. It just seemed like there were so few on the subtraction one that it's a concern because that's all fourth grade. That was, that was one classroom. And um, it is in German. German. That's what we're, you know, their basic math knowledge is something we really need to push. And that's why we're making it one of our goals. And we've really, um, more than previous years, we're really making a push to use different strategies and ways to monitor it, you know, the fluency of the facts. So. Well, I appreciate that because that's something that I pushed when I was on the field. And was that they needed to know the math. Right. You can't do the math fast enough to complete the test if you don't have the facts. Right. And, and we're really one way to learn them, really. Well, and with the number talks and everything, we're really talking about approaching it in a different way than we approached it. We've done this, talked about it for the past couple of years since um, the math coaching has come along, but um, the rote memorization isn't going to get um, us, the way we all learned math is very different now. Mm -hmm. so, and I think getting the teachers on board with that, you have a lot of success with that, and I think that you're really going to start seeing the difference um, in those scores. And then um, in the enrichment, this goes for either coach, um, how are we rising the students in the brain to go get to um, advanced and accelerated? Well, one, I know for, I, I've been making a point to talk about those higher kids um, in collaboration meetings uh, with the teachers, talking about how we have to, um, we can't just leave them behind. We do have higher achieving students that need um, to be challenged, and that doesn't mean just more work. It means could be on the same topic for math, but we might say um, they're doing word problems over and over again. It's a very common um, across grade level, but they might be they might be able to do a two-step word problem, whereas the class is doing one-step word problem. Just sort of uh, making it more of a challenge. Or um, for one thing we talked we talked about this morning in our collaboration meeting for the students that are proficient in division, where you have a lot of kids that aren't then um, instead of just having them practice division problems, have them write some division word problems because you can't write a division word problem if you don't really understand what division means. So things like that, we do talk, we have discussions about that for math. Yeah, I'd like to see them push it a little bit because it's boring for them mm -hmm. and you'll lose them and lose their excitement. And in terms of, and we need to have more that are, are scoring up at the proficient advanced levels it seemed like for a while we were pushing those students mm -hmm. to that point. So that's also like I was saying with that strategic monitoring. How if you had a student who had a 33 in, this, in September, which is a good score, but if they just took it in November and they still have a 33, that's a way to say, well, you know, they haven't grown since they're still above average. They're still going to score great, but I haven't moved them at all. So you know, sort of that's a way to keep our eye on that as well. How are you involving parents? Well, I, I can only speak personally for my own group. So I've sent a letter home to the parents that I work with explaining that they're in this math intervention and giving them their e my email address. Um, and that, you know, if they have any questions, that they can contact me. That's just for my, I only see 12 students. But, um, in the tutors and um, those um, giving the interventions have also sent letters home um, are encouraged to call the parents um, if there are <coughs> concerns and talk to the teachers. And, and at the um, conferences, we were asked if needed to sit in at conferences, um, show that, you know, sending books home daily, encouraging the parents to listen to the child read, encouraging the children to read to the parents. <coughs> and, um, and that's all through letter form. Okay, we just probably come to probably looking at, I think, questions probably in the world we're looking at the entire world because I think Mary got lots of things to do and specifically in the building to deal with climate. And I know that the parents have been involved in that, so you might want to speak to that a little bit now. Yeah, 
Yeah, when we um, when we have students that we've identified as you know we struggling behaviorally, um, I know Mrs. Boca and myself have spent um, many many phone calls on you know talking to parents and and you know explaining to them what we're seeing at the school. And what I will say is that by and large, we you know we have a lot of support from the parents, and and we frame everything in the sense that you know we want to do what's best for your child, not only today but into the future. We've got them for a few years. You have them for the rest of your life. So we want to make sure that we can start to change behavior. And um, what we with the check-in, check-out system, our, our plan is to get these children to the point where they have someone that they trust. They might not make the best choice every minute of every day, but if they do, they have a chance to get, if they make a poor choice, they have a chance to get themselves back on track. And really making the parents aware of the fact that we are, we're investing human resources outside of your child's classroom teacher to, to you know, improve their behavior so that they can become more productive, not only in school, but in the community. And you know, making sure that the parents are aware of that. And you know, I will say that they they have been extremely supportive, and they you know they want to do what they can to help us. And you know, when when we explain to them the things that that we're doing at school, and what are some of the things that you're doing at home, I think that that's when the communication starts happening. That's when we start to see the changes happening. Just and just want to add a couple of things. One of the things that we talked about is looking at non-traditional ways of involving parents. I think um, Ms. Thomas outlined the. Check in, check out, which is a great, I mean, I think that's a great way of involving different people because what happens a lot of times is that they may not necessarily connect with this one teacher, but with someone else who can look at things a little bit different, it makes it a little bit easier for them to be able to connect. So that's just one one thing. And then also throughout uh, this group, as I was going through and talking to the community, we looked at uh, how might we then look at, at involving uh, parents in some different ways. So we're going to be having some communication and conversation with administrators about different ways that we can involve the community in the schools because we, we know and we realize that we've got to reach out and we've got to do more than just send invitations to be able to get people uh, in and get them involved and make them actively involved. So um, that's something that we're all going to, uh, to to make sure that we do. But I do like how the uh, short group is starting to, to look at different kinds of ways and involving all the staff. But that is something that certainly we're going to do. Um, and I think sharing some of the strategies, because we have been It's been quite a road uh, getting to where we are now. Um, 
there, there, were, there were times along that road where we, we, we looked in the tunnel looking for the light at the end of the tunnel and we weren't sure if it was the light or if it was the oncoming train and I'm here tonight to report that finally we, we, we do see the light at the end of this tunnel with regard to this project. So uh, we're, we're very happy about that. Uh, in just over 13 months, we built four schools, uh, 68,000 square feet per school, and uh, they, they, we put the first brick in the ground, I think last August uh, is what it was, and in September we had four beautiful new schools, and, and, and looking back on how difficult it was when you walk through these buildings every day, uh, and, and on a regular basis uh, as we do, um, you, you see how, how much of a improvement and what a benefit these schools are to our district and to our students and our staff and, and it's great to see how they're utilizing the technology and, and the space that, that has been afforded them by, by our community. Um, the most pressing, pressing issue I think we have had and we continue to have is with our HVAC system, with our heating specifically. Um, I, I've had to been tempered down a couple times by the OSFC because of my impatience in getting this 100% uh, right. But in a project like this, it's from what I understand, it's not uncommon to have these issues into the project, when, especially in light of the fact how everything was kind of jammed together and consolidated because of some unforeseen circumstances, weather related and, and uh, uh, permits and, and, and so many other things that took place at the beginning of this project. So instead of uh, completing these uh, buildings in July, we were faced with moving in over the Labor Day weekend. And uh, that didn't allow for the technicians to, to test the HVAC systems in, in a way that they should. It didn't allow for the commissioning agents to go through and really give their seal of approval. Uh, so, so what we have now is, is, is a bunch of uh, contractors and commissioning agents. Uh, the state, Dennis, has been out here with us uh, PCS, um, uh, mechanical engineers, mechanical contractors, all going through these buildings, the, the temperature control guys. Uh, we had a meeting about two weeks ago, and all of us uh, walked through all four school, well, three of the four school buildings to understand what the issues were. Uh, again, I'm pleased to report that it seems like we've gotten a handle on, on these, these issues. Uh, there are some um, installation deficiencies that were involved in the reason why we've, we've had some some of the issions we had, and I apologize to the teachers who are here tonight. I know some of you guys have been real hot, some days are real cold other days, so I thought we're working on it. Uh, but we expect in January we should have all of these issues uh, rectified and the ability to have uh, the temperature in the room be monitored within a about four to five degree parameter for our teachers uh, to, to make them comfortable and our students comfortable. So we're well on our way to that. We've identified the problems. We're all aware of the problems. We're, we're working on uh, getting them fixed. We have uh, the, the missing equipment on back order. And again, uh, it should be much better today than it was a couple weeks ago. And it should continue to get better. And by January, we should have a fully functioning system. Uh, a question I, I saw uh, earlier in the month was, when will our playgrounds be done? Uh, again, I'm happy to report all but one playground is complete. That playground is at Shoreview on the front side, the 260th side of Shoreview. And what we are waiting for now is just a rubber insert that requires the ground temperature to be above 50 degrees to be installed. So again, when it looks like we're, we're out until spring uh, for this playground. But it, it's functional. Uh, they can use it. Uh, it's, it's not exactly what we want it to be. Uh, we need to be a little bit careful on it. But uh, they, they, they can, all, all the playgrounds in the district are functioning. The parking lots, uh, I saw that as a question uh, a couple weeks ago when our parking lots be done. Again, happy to report all the parking lots are complete, the directional signage is in, and we're, we're moving along and hopefully the, again, the teacher's short it's just ironic that you're here, hopefully the pickup procedures and drop off procedures have improved as, as we've completed these parking lots and got the signs. Um, Another issue we've had, probably the second most uh, challenging issue, though we, we, were, uh, we were a little bit more fortunate in getting this rectified than we were with the heating issues, uh, were the issues with NetTech and our, our technology in each of the rooms. Um, this week, 
Ted Lysak is sending a group of uh, folks out to survey every room. So every room is going to be visited uh, this week, and we're going to talk to every teacher and find out what their problems still are. Hopefully, the, those problems are few and far between, but we expect we're going to have some. I would say we're probably 95% complete, and, and everybody's up and running, and uh, hopefully everybody's happy and, and learning uh, the technology. I know that Mr. Lysak is also planning a training session, tra training sessions between now and January, between the breaks, so that everybody, all the teachers and staff, will have access to training between now and, and by the time they leave for break. But uh, I, I can also report that it seems, uh, it's been reported to me anyway, that all of the technology in the cafetoriums are working, the presentation areas, and certainly uh, it was a rush at the last minute for Mr. Bell's first town hall meeting at uh, Bluestone, but the tech technicians came and they were able to set everything up. I believe that's the case in all four buildings now. Regarding, uh, there, there, there are some other minor issues, very minor. Uh, one would be furniture. Um, we, we've had some uh, requests for different furniture in the rooms. We've tried to accommodate all of those requests. Uh, if, if we've had enough to go around for the entire district, uh, we've certainly accommodated those. Uh, there are other requests that we may not be able to accommodate. We, we kind of have what we have. Uh, and, and I can give you an example, uh, the kindergarten tables, the kidney-shaped tables. They're awfully big. Uh, I understand that. It doesn't allow for, for a lot of uh, activities to take place away from the tables. I understand that as well, and I apologize for that. But uh, that's what was spec'd out. We, we can certainly, down the road, uh, take a look. But I, I, again, I would recommend that we give it a couple months and, and see how we can, how the teachers can, can adapt and, and, and make what they have in their rooms right now work for them. Uh, another. Uh, uh, issue that is coming up shortly is the commissioning of the buildings. In fact, the electrical and plumbing commissioning is underway. Uh, the HVAC systems, again, we, we are waiting until we have final installation of, of those systems, the HVAC system, uh, before the commissioning agents will come out. We expect that commissioning to be done, hopefully, uh, for the electrical and plumbing by the beginning of the year or so. Uh, Pat, is that correct? It is. Wednesday. Wednesday, good. Um, as far as punch lists go, uh, at the end of every project, uh, a punch, uh, the architects go through the buildings and they inspect the buildings and they create what's called a punch list. And a punch list is, are, are there items you know, within the building that are installed but maybe not complete, uh, maybe not uh, done uh, according to spec. And, and the architects go through uh, with, with a pretty fine tooth comb and they identify these punch list items. They go back to the appropriate contractor and the contractor is charged with completing these punch list items. Once they make a report that these items are complete, the architect will then go back in and, and, and do a uh, back punch, is what they call it, which is essentially another punch list, say, no, I'm still not happy with this, this, and this. But in Chardon Hills, the architects came up with 969 punch list items. All but uh, 71 have been completed. At Shoreview, uh, I'm sorry, at Arbor, there are 817 punch list items. Again, all but 70, 71 have been completed. Shoreview, there were 980 punch list items. Uh, 118 remain open. And at Bluestone, 1,153 punch items, out of, of which 128 remain open. Again, these, these are all items that uh, were identified as the architect as, as needing attention. Once the attention is given by the appropriate contractor, we'll go back and we'll they'll check again and make sure that they were completed to, to the, the, the standard there. Uh, and, and the last thing I have, in, in week, uh, I'm sorry, month 11, uh, the OSFC conducts a walkthrough uh, to make sure that uh, there are no warranty items missed, that, that we, we identify any, any issues that we're having in our rooms and we, and we identify any warranties that we may have an opportunity to go back to the contractor, the manufacturer, and say, hey, you know, this isn't working correctly. So in preparation for that, in April and May, we will, we're going to figure out a way to survey each teacher, uh, whether that be school dude or whether that be uh, in another arena. We will, we will survey every teacher in, in every room in the district and ask them if there are any nagging problems that they've had since the, the buildings opened up. And those issues, we will identify those issues, we'll pass those issues on to the OSFC and we'll, we'll, we'll study whether we have 
reason to, to uh, ask for a warranty for those items if, if, if it's within our specs. Our, our specs. So that will be take, taking place in, in April and May. Uh, and that's about all that I have right now. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Just one thing I just want to clarify, just for the public, you know, OSSC is Ohio School Facilities Commission, and so that's the organization that uh, <coughs> is a part and monitors our uh, the construction process. I just want to be clear on that. Okay. Those people that gave us 41% of the money for the project. Just a little clarification on the level of walkthrough. It's not necessarily for one that goes. Do me a favor, just come to the podium so we can hear. Sure. Uh, so we know who we are yeah. speaking. Dennis Kaplan from the OSFC. Good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah. uh, a little clarification on the level of walkthrough. It really doesn't happen until we actually accept the building, or each of you look at the building. If we have HVAC issues that we see presently, until that system functions properly, it's completed 100%. You don't have to accept the building. So at that point, going forward a little months is when the, when the actual warranty period or the level of the would actually transpire. So these buildings have some issues that need to be fixed, even though they're minor, until you actually accept these buildings, your warranty period would start going forward. So yeah, just so you know that you're not accepting these buildings with issues that are deficient. So. Mm -hmm. At this point, they should all be installed. The oh, the monument, monument signs. signs. Yes. The monument signs that we're, we're still uh, tied up in, uh, in the city uh, right now with regard to uh, an approval process. Uh, we, we submitted a design uh, that was rejected. Uh, that is, is still in the process of being redesigned and submitted to the, to the committee. Contractor 
Rosa sneezed blue version. Miles is, is contesting that a bit. Go ahead, Pat. Yeah, there's the first yeah, one I've from the phone. <laughs> Mr. Pat Brand from, from, from Peace of This. Uh, th there's a disagreement right now as it relates to scope between the contractor and um, uh, all of us collectively on the other side. Um, what they've done temporarily in good faith just in the last week is uh, put up studs and plywood and tie back to you know, enclose the building in a temporary fashion, um, better than it was before. Um, we have uh, told them that you know what they've done is not conforming, put them on notice. Um, they have committed to us that they have additional information that proves that you know if we want something different, that they are with us back. And, and uh, that's one of the issues that we talked about at the HVAC summit, we've been calling it um, two weeks ago, and we're having a follow-up meeting with where we are on all those issues this Thursday. So um, they're to bring whatever additional documentation they have to that Thursday meeting for hopefully a final resolution. I was going to say if they don't provide it, because uh, you gave them a cure um, notice, didn't you? Yes. Okay. And what time frame were they supposed to have it? It was that they had to prove that they've ordered it within 15 days, which just happens to be Thursday. So um, they've submitted pricing um, because their position is that it's a, that they're entitled to a change order to do it differently because they believe that they're within you know the contract documents. So, um, but we've rejected the pricing because we've said that no, you owe us this without additional cost. Um, so, have you re-looked at the specs to make sure that yes. that's how they broke? Yeah. Um, they would have to show me something that I have not yet seen. And this be another. There's two sets of specs that I really want to understand. But well, it, it's it's more. Um, there is definitely a conflict between the mechanical drawings and the architectural drawings, um, and so it becomes well, which overrides which. And um, they prepared shop drawings for these louvers um, that have specific sizes on them. It's it's not a black and white issue. It, there are some. Um, it can be seen from different perspectives. So um, it could be an interpretation issue. It is an interpretation issue. Um, that said, you know we our position was that they had to fix it. Um, uh, if, if they can show us where they got. Appro approval on what's out there from the architect, which the architect has said he did not give, um, then that would be new information. And based on that new information, we may need to um, investigate either. Th this is purely an aesthetic thing. So um, in fact, the other three schools have this condition that's out there now, much less obvious location. Did uh, Miles do was it like two Yep. Did they do all four schools? No, they only did um, Charlie Mills. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. Um, what about downspouts? That's your <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was your meeting. Mm -hmm. um, downspouts. Um, the downspout. Boots are on and up, although they are not painted because the spec did not call for them to be painted. So we will be painting them in place. Um, at uh, Chardon Hills and at Bluestone, they are here, and a color was just selected the other day because they weren't in the spec to be painted, so there wasn't a color for them. So we got here, we just got what color the architects would like to see, and they're being painted in the shop. Would they be painted the same color as the downspouts? Well, you would think so, but the mm -hmm. downspouts are white, and since these are cast iron, they are going to rust all the time. And a white painted downspout will leave streaks of rust. So we did not want to paint them white, but it looks like it's the lesser of two evils. Black would have looked better, but then you would have had a white downspout, a black boot, 
up against the wall. So that's less than I do. Well, that's why I wasn't in the spec. It had a tank. So. Okay. And then it's short views? And it's short that the short views Arbors. are in. Um, Arbors, um, they are still on the way. They aren't delivered yet. What about the grading at Sharpen Hills and on the back side where there's cooling water and several areas? Um, yeah, that's on, yeah, on the, at Sharpen Hills. Mm -hmm. On the back side where the bus drop off yeah. is and the back leg drop. Yeah, there's the, the exterior punch lists were a little came out a little later um, than the interior build just because it's still a construction site essentially. Um, so that's on the punch list that will be addressed. That we've had a little difficulty getting new to some of the areas because it's been wet and we're just gonna make even more of a mess getting to some of these areas. So. I just yeah, I remember that the um, water standing right For the meeting today, we're going to put that out for bid in January when, uh, when business isn't as, as prominent for landscapers. <coughs> but we're going to go with the landscaping company uh, and, and bid that out with them. And they're a little bit more slow, hopefully, to leverage it. We make sure that the Euclid landscapers are included. Absolutely. Okay. All right, I guess that's all I have. And you know, I didn't ride by today, Jack, but bike rack, short view. Because for a while there, the bike, I was driving by at lunchtime and the bikes were being locked up the tree on the tree lawn and up against that fence. There were little kids like, are there they now? Are so. As of last week, yeah. it's been about two weeks since I've been behind the yeah. school, but I'm just kind of curious. Because one day when I drove by, all the bikes were up on the trees. It's like, yeah, they, they say they have been installed in the front, so that's good. We, we still have, uh, occasionally we'll, we'll get uh, residents calling and uh, we, we've installed our, our signage uh, in, in the parking lot. We have spoken with uh, the Euclid Police Department. Uh, our security team has been out there on numerous occasions to, to try to get uh, folks from uh, parking on the side of the street where it says no parking. But that's the big issue that we have right now is that uh, there, there are some people parking where they shouldn't on city streets, pretty much rendering a two-way street uh, a, a one-way path, and uh, we're, we're trying to we're trying to control that investment. Because I think if the weather gets worse, that probably will get worse. It's definitely going to get worse, and, and the Euclid Police Department has has offered their cooperation. So. some cases maybe. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question about, um, this is kind of specific, but it was just something that I kind of witnessed. Like the functionality of, of like the cubbies and the shelving in the cubbies with the plastic brackets and the fact that when a child goes to pull his book bag off, the whole shelf comes out. And there's no way a young child can put the shelf back in. So. What, what do we do about things like that that truly aren't functioning the way you would think that they should be? That's a design problem. Like, who, who yeah. Uh, well, certainly we can we can talk to PCS and that, that Infinity is is the contractor who, who is responsible for all the shelving, and, and certainly we can speak with them about that. Uh, but ultimately, what may have to happen is that we we drill a screw or, or two, one on each side. And, small screws and keep it in place. Uh, we'll definitely speak with the community about that, but again, we're, they are, as are we, bound by the, the spec and the scope of the work, and if it didn't call for those things to be passed in place, uh, we'll probably have our team do that. Yeah, because when you witness something like that, you just wonder the logic of, of the actual shelf. That's 
first I wrote it, so I appreciate it. I mean, it's kind of interesting to see, but he just the whole show comes out at like on the kindergarten. It was kind of odd that it would be true. Sure. Yeah, we'll look into that. Again, I'll speak with Infinity, and if not, we'll get our team. I just wondered who was responsible for that situation. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Higley. Uh, I have a, just a question about the lead certification process. I'm assuming that we can't go ahead with kind of beginning that process until we have the HVAC and punch list items in place. Um, but do you know what the timetable on that would be? I'm not sure. Pat Perrin will can offer some uh, advice on that. Yeah, the, lead, the lead certification is a multi-step process. Um, first, your design documents have to be submitted. Um, and you know, just like anything else, sometimes you, you, you finally achieve your lead certification well after the project is done. Um, the design phase submission had been submitted. Uh, and it was reviewed and returned with comments that the architect needed to respond to and either provide additional information or greater detail or something like that. Uh, then there's a construction phase. We get some points for um, things like uh, you know, how we procure materials, how far away they come from, how uh, uh, we recycle our construction debris, uh, and all the contractors have submitted documentation specific. There's a lead section in each prime contract. So we have that documentation as well. And that is turned over to the architect because the architect is, is really the lead, the lead person for lead. Um, so uh, they are working on submitting the construction phase things, and they're also working on the responses to design phase things. But, um, the last part, we do get additional points for uh, extra commissioning or a, a greater level of commissioning. So when we get the commissioning reports, that's the, that's sort of the third uh, component to these. So uh, right now, two out of three of the components are in some form of making progress, and the third will be uh, once we do uh, the commissioning. Now, we're able to commission the heating system uh, because there's a load on the building right now and it's functioning. We are not able to commission uh, to commission the cooling side, and this happens often with schools. Um, but we basically have to wait until there's a call for air conditioning uh, and a load on the building. So that part of the commissioning, they'll have to come back and, you know, when it gets warm enough. Uh, so that'll be an open item for the commissioning maybe until the spring. Yeah, my understanding of the lead process was that we, we traditionally just had to wait six months after the building was open to kind of complete some of that stuff, but I just wasn't sure with some of the delays that we've had in getting some of the HVAC units included, whether or not we would kind of begun that six-month process or whether or not we hadn't begun that six-month process. Well, we, I, I, I don't really know, um, I don't really know about the six-month, I mean, I don't know if that's just sort of a, um, uh, it's just a timetable that I've heard is, oh, is commonplace. Okay. Well, um, I mean, you just explained the difference between the heating system and the, and the air conditioning system, and that makes sense. Right. Um, but again, so it seems like that perhaps the, the final phase of the lead certification actually has not been delayed, but that's what I was thinking. No, and, and, and we, you know, like in every school's a weekly job meeting, there was a section on lead, lead submittals, lead documentation, and all those types of things. Uh, so it's something we've been working on since day one, really. Uh, so, you know, we're in pretty good shape, at least in terms of gathering of both the design information and the construction phase information. And now it's just that final component, which is the actual installed performance of the building and those reports that would be the last part. Okay. Uh, Mr. Higley, this question is for you. Have you received as-built documents yet? They're, they're, on their, they're coming in almost daily. Uh, dropped off a uh, box last week, but yes, they are coming in. Okay. Like make sure those get secured well when That's right. upstairs. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for your job overall.
I am I am set up a <coughs> resolution to employ uh, law firm of Walter Haverfield. Uh, this has been requested by our uh, uh, services department uh, to uh, get uh, legal services and stuff like that. Is there a motion? So moved by Mr. Smith, second by Mr. Sitter. We use that before. Yes. 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 Yes.